ever a doubt in the mind of God of, of him um, saving us. He, he doesn't repent about what he did with his son or what he did in the shedding of his own blood for our redemption. Uh, there's no repentance with God. And so what God did for us and what God did with us, uh, we're having technical difficulties here. I can see it in my screen, so I know you're having problems with me if you're watching on Facebook. Um, so what God is, has done is, according to his good intention, and here's the thing about that. That is because God's happy feeling about us or love for us has nothing to do with how good we are or how right we are. Have you ever thought about that? How many people do you know? Uh, well, you might, you might feel like this as a parent, um, maybe as a sibling, when your siblings are coming to the world, especially if you're the older, or even if you're the youngest. You, you grew up with affection. Now, when y'all start getting older and start falling out and fighting, that's a different thing. But when you're growing up, you start having a love for somebody that you had has nothing to do with their behavior. And parents love children coming into the world uh, not knowing uh, what any of their behavior or characteristics uh, would be like. But the difference is God knew what our character or our characteristics would be like even before we got here and, and here's the wow moment. He still loved us enough to save us. He still loved us enough to save us. He still loved us enough to have a plan, a design, divine plan to make us the sons and daughters of his family. Adoption and and inheritance with God is no small matter. You know, people go down and do make do adoptions all the time. People adopt children all the time. Um, do it because they want to show somebody love. They do it because sometimes because maybe they were not able to, you know, bear children. A lot of different reasons. See, but God was not constrained or compelled by any reason other than. It pleased him. It pleased him to take his creation and place him in his family by the way of Jesus Christ. I think that's I think that's kind of exciting when you think about it. It's kind of exciting when you think about what God has done. When you look at John chapter 3, verse 16, the Bible says, For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. That's a, a well-rehearsed verse, and you see it everywhere. Probably one of the most familiar passages in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world argumentably because we just got finished studying that God is bringing all things together in Christ Jesus. He's bringing all things together. Even the world, uh, the cosmos and the chronos, the world uh, being out of source and he's reconciling. We read that in Romans where even the, the creations are groaning and moaning for the day of reconciliation or for the days it would be set right um, so when we think about God so loved the world, he has enough love for the entirety of his creation, but the focal point of his love is mankind, but you can't separate his love from mankind from his entire creation simply because the beauty of the entire creation was for man. So if he's going to set he loves the world another. So if he's going to set man right, he cannot neglect the entirety of creation 
that he created for man to live and enjoy. See, he created everything and told Adam and Eve, now you have dominion over all of this. Every creature, every fowl of the air, every sea, creature of the sea, creeping, crawling things, you are the dominion of authority over all of that. The, the, the herbs, the fruit, uh, all those things will yield to you. But when things fell out of order, then he told Adam, from the sweat of thy brow, you're going to eat. So now the earth was not just so willing to give up her goods for the man. He had to work to bring it forth from the earth. Are y'all still here? So when he says, so when he says God so loved the world, a lot of times we hear it doesn't mean the world, it just means man. At the end of the day, it's about man. But when you read what we just read about how the whole world is groaning for uh, the, the to be set right, and they can't wait for God to set things in order. That's Romans chapter 8, just to help you stay abreast of the conversation. Romans chapter 8, verse number 20. It says, for the, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. Just talking about in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we, verse number 22, for we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. So he's talking about the whole world is waiting for order to be regained. But it's not just the order of the world that God is concerned about. The God's love and order of the world is for his creation, for man. So, so for God so loved the world that he gave his son that all things might be reconciled together in Christ Jesus, especially the man being a part of his family. Any questions, any comments about that? There's no need in having man in an upright, straight, glorified position and the world is still crazy. I'm not talking about people, I'm talking about the chaos of the world. Remember the, the garden, right? From the sweat of thy brow. Uh, somebody said that weeds and all those things were not meant to be, but with the order being not out of order or the chaos with man's fall, all those things came about. Uh, and so when God is putting this thing back together in Christ, he's doing it for his creation. I tell you all the time, the beauty of the beauty of being a Christian, let, let me share, help us understand the passage like it, it rains on the just and the unjust, the sun shines on the just and the unjust. And this is a hallelujah moment for saints, but it's not a boastful, it's not a bragging moment, it's a moment that we see the vast love of God. Uh, the love of God that is so broad and so deep that he allows all to partake of it. But when you think about doctors, when you think about medication, when you think about um, fresh water, uh, all the things that we might call leisures or comforts, even some of the things that might be of necessity. I want you to get this. So I want you to, I want you to catch this. I want you to really catch this. When you think about all of these things, they were in design 
to care for and nurture and make sure God's people can make it until the day of Christ's coming. Why is that why is that critical? Because when we think about doctors, let's just stay with doctors for a moment. When we think about doctors, I'm gonna give you the two probably two of the biggest things that we all probably can relate to. When you think about doctors and, and the educators of the world, the professors, uh, the teachers, uh, you think about doctors and teachers and what it took for them to achieve and accomplish the status necessary to teach and to be professors at some of our further learning institutions or higher learning institutions um, and the medical field. You, you ever thought about the fact that as blessed are their hands are and they're skillful in their knowledge and medicine and able to diagnose and, and go into the body and figure things out? Are they able to teach all people no matter their ethnicity or their culture or their, you know. Have you ever thought about the fact that they're not all Christians? They're not all saints. All of them don't even believe in God. Yeah, have you ever thought about that? And if God was only blessing, only blessing, only blessing Christians to be doctors to save other Christians, it might not be a lot of us here. All of us don't have the capacity to be a doctor. All of us don't have the capacity to be teachers. But God took all of these people, the people that make automobiles and build houses. God has taken all of these hands. This is the, the wisdom of God and all of these people and all of these skills and all of these talents. And he's put them in the earth for his pleasure, but for the pleasure of his people to enjoy. It's kind of like the Egyptians held the children of Israel for all those years. And when it got time for the exodus, God took the same people who had them in slavery all those years and they blessed the Israelites so magnanimous, so large that they can hardly carry the jewels, the gold, the diamond, the silver, all the uh, fine stones, the rubies, the emeralds, the sapphire stones, and all the fine linens, the silk, the, the purple, and all of those things. Just I want you to just think about that. They carry all of that out of Egypt, but they went into Egypt with nothing. The Bible says the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. It's in Proverbs. It's something for you to understand. And so when God is doing great things and by the hands of other people, it has nothing to do with them being. will benefit by it. You see how deep God is in the planning for his children even before we got here? It's just, sometimes it's just too heavy to think about. You try and try to put all that in perspective. It's just amazing how God can just take all of this and make it fit for his people. Anyway, Y'all kind of quiet tonight, but because I'm not, because I'm not talking excited and loud. Because I just want this to be, a, I want this part of this lesson right here to be sombering, but I wanted to settle in. I wanted to grab you. I want you to think about it. What is God's attitude toward us? We are in the inclusion of God's kind intention and his good pleasure. We are in the included or part of the inclusion of God's good pleasure or and his kind intention. Now look at look at question number nine. What does it mean to live to the praise of his glory? Now the author is asking us to look at verses 612 
and 14. And the common phrase there is, to the praise of God's glory. The first time it's mentioned in verse number 6, to the praise of God's glory and grace, or the graciousness of God's glory, or in the grace of God's glory. Uh, how is that word? Uh, to the praise of the glory of his grace. And then the next time in verse number 12, he says, to the end that we who his glory. And then in verse 14, who is given us as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. What does it mean to live to the praise of his glory? Um, the verses um, don't all point to us doing anything in living to his glory as much as he made us alive for his glory. I think we get that in um, let's see this Philippian letter. Philippians oh. it, it, it is a sense of gratitude that we have to have after we understand what God has done um, but remember he, he did this the first verse that's mentioned in verse 6 is part of his predestined his, we are predestined or we were designed or called prior to ever coming here. But it still says to the praise of his glory. So it's not living as in doing, not, not all the way as much as it is how we ought to receive our life that he's given us because of his glory does that make sense how we are huh to live to the praise of his glory is more of we've been made alive to the praise of his glory um Philippians chapter 2 verse number 13 says for it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure that's one time then in Ephesians where we are chapter 2 it says in verse number 10 for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. We are his workmanship. So when we think about living to the praise of his glory, it's not yet, and it will be, and it does mean that ultimately. My brother said right, living in a place of gratitude for what God has done for us, what God has planned and laid out for us, even before we got here. Uh, when we look back on what God went through in his planning and how many years it took for this plan to unfold, um, we ought to live with a sense of gratitude, a thankfulness for what God has done for us and how he's brought it out all about for us is certainly for his glory. I think also it, it says when, he talks, when Paul's talking to the church at Colossae, I think it's chapter 2, verse 14. Um, no, chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse number 12. The Bible says, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God 
who raised him for the dead. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he, listen to this, he made you alive together with him. Listen to that. When you were dead in trespasses or when you did in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your nature. That's what the flesh means here. He made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, canceling all the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us. But the, but the emphasis on when we were dead in our transgressions and the uncleanliness of our nature, he made us alive. That's to his glory. The intent of God was always to have man in communion with him. And when we understand that, like my brother just shared, then it, it calls for us to live with a little more gratitude for what God has done. And in those three verses, 6, 12, go ahead, what you say, LaCroix? I was going to say, and this is the thing that we talk about in chapter 2 and 3, when we talk about the day of the Lord, when it is redemption, you know, all these things going to happen, we're coming to the time of the day of the Lord, which is about the day of the Lord, and the day of the Lord, and the day of the Lord, and the day of the Lord. Absolutely. Where are we at over there in uh, 2 Peter 3, around verse 10 or 11? Yeah. Or more like 11 and 12, since all these things, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 11 and 12. He's, he says, all these things will be destroyed in this way, talking about the fire and destruction of the world. What sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct, conversation? Not just talking your life and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. If you're looking for these things, this new heaven, this new earth, uh, when the Bible talks about in Revelation, when that new city comes down and the, the union, the, the uh, What's that marriage thing? The consummation of the marriage takes place. Uh, right now, we are a, a bride in waiting. Uh, we are in the uh, engagement process or the betrothed process. We're waiting to be united in the husbandry of Jesus the Christ and in the kingdom, uh, that heavenly portion of the kingdom. And so he says, since you're waiting for these things, ought you not to be found Carrying on like you know, I said it last week. I said it last week, uh, not Sunday, uh, last Wednesday. It's time for the children of God to really. Be living like we are saved. Are we living like we are saved? Are we living like we are saved? See, we're too busy trying to right wrongs, and we should be, and clean up behind the mess we're making along the way, and we should be. But being proactive in the understanding of God, proactivity, what God did is proactive to us ever being. And if we live in a proactive state of mind because of the proactivity of God, then maybe some of these messes we don't even have to clean up. 
maybe some of these things that we're trying cognizant and we try to be cognizant be diligent doesn't mean be perfect it means be deliberate it means operating with intentionality i am focused on my behavior i am focused on my, the words that come out of my mouth not all not necessarily I'm not even talking about cussing and that, that's part of it but i mean just how you talk to people how you talk about people how you handle people the words you share with people just i mean ask yourself do i walk and talk like i'm saved do i walk and talk like god chose me before i ever got here do I walk and talk like I've been consecrated and called, made a, made more than a conqueror? Is, is this my, is this what people see with me when they see me or when they hear me or when they hear of me? What is it? What is it that they see or hear about me? You know people are lying. You know people tell you know say things are not true. We know people assassinate character and try to tear down your good works. What well, we understand all of that, and it will. But we're talking about now in a moment of truth. The places you venture, the company you keep. Can they say? Like they said, like that centurion soldier said on. When somebody assassinates you and kills you, can they look on you? Can somebody look on you and say, truly, this man was a child of God? Amen. Can they say that? When you leave the room and that crowd has been talking about you and, and somebody knows you and they can say, no, this is an innocent man. He's a just man. I find no fault in him. And of course, we're not talking about no fault. We, we want to be spiritual and mature minded about this. But can they say that about you entering and leaving a space with people? Can you leave that in their way? Live, living to the praise of his glory is a place of gratitude. It is a place of thinking about what we're looking forward to or towards according to second peter chapter three uh it also is talking about how god made us alive for his remember his name's sake he leads us in the path of righteousness for his name's sake moses moses with the children of israel in the wilderness said father god he said father god you brought us out here to die you're going to let uh, the, the Malachites, you're going to let them kill us. You're going to leave us out here like this. You're going to leave us pinned against the river. And now here come the Egyptians and, you, and, you, and we left Egypt and now here we are. And he always reminded God, if you do that, Lord, they're going to make fun of you. They're going to make mockery of you. This is your people. <laughs> your name is on the line here. Your name is at stake. It had nothing to do with how Israel was behaving. It had nothing to do with the things they would do when they would make the golden calf, when they would start complaining and and and, and just disregarding Moses. It had nothing to do with that. Moses' prayer says, Lord, your name is on the line. And so God made them alive to the praise of his glory. Now, we have to live so that it's not in vain. And my brother was dead on. But when we look at those verses again, 6, 12, and 14. We're going to wrap this up. 6, 12, and 14 of chapter 1. To the pray, listen to this. Verse number 5 says, He predestined us to the praise of his glory of the glory of his grace. 
he predestined us to the praise of the glory of his grace. Uh, three aspects are given in the praise of his glory. And um, the three aspects of the praise are now determined by the, the pointing of the text. So the text says predestined of our adoption to the praise of the glory of his grace. So now we're talking about an eternity past. See, we were made alive. We were already alive in the mind of Christ before we ever got here. He predestined us to be in his grace for his glory. See, the first aspect of time that Paul points to the, the praise of his glory is eternity past. We don't even know when that was. Ever since God is, I've longer than we can imagine. You're older than 30. You're older than 40. You're older than 50. You're older than 70. You're older than 12. Where? In the mind of God. When we became, oh, I'm going the wrong direction here. This might be too much. But when we became uh, living beings and man became a living soul, then we took on uh, an element of being determined by chronology. <laughs> I don't even know why I do this kind of stuff because I know it just probably just bothers you and blows your mind. But if we were always in the mind of Christ means, it sounds like, ooh, we've always been. Just something to think about, isn't it? I, I can't give you no more right now. We don't have time. Predestined, that's one element of his glory. But then he says, in verse number 12, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be. So now he's talking about eternity in the now. It was always in the mind before we were, always in his mind as we are. To hope in Christ for the praise of his glory. Now Paul is speaking Jewish here, but he's talking to the nation of Christians at large. To the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. But there's no more praise to the glory of those who were first than those who are last. All of us remember the parable of Christ and the servants. Where one came in in the morning for a couple of bucks. One came in in the afternoon for a couple of dollars. And then one came in right before the close of the day when it was time to punch out and the Lord gave him $2 and, and the service said, how does he get the same pay we got and he just got here? <laughs> Christ said, I didn't tell you about how long you had to be here to get paid. I just said, if you're here working for me, this is a parable, you all get paid the same price. It's not about how long you work, it's that you work. It was 12 and you're now 112. Or you just became a Christian while you was 110 and now you're 112. Your reward for working and laboring with him is the same. You just agree to work for the reward or the reward would be yours under hire. And I promised you, this is Christ, I promised you, I promised to pay you. I didn't say if you if you started too late, so you're gonna get a little bit, or you started early, you're gonna get more. I just said, I'm promise I'm gonna give you two dollars. I'm gonna give you these two dollars if you work. So the eternity in the now is the, and then you have the eternity in the future, or eternity future, and that's the promise of inheritance. Verse number fourteen, 
it says the Holy Spirit was given us as a pledge of our inheritance that we haven't seen yet. That's what we're waiting for. That's what my brother just shared with us in Second Peter chapter three. If we're looking forward to these things, the inheritance we're waiting for, I'm waiting for my mansion, robe, and crown. I'm waiting for my house not made in hand, not made with hand. I'm waiting for the whiteness of my robe. I'm waiting to see my name written in that stone. I'm waiting to see my name called in the Lamb's book of life. I'm waiting for what the old folks to say, when the roll is called up yonder, I'm waiting to be there. So we see three different aspects of the praise of his glory, eternity past, eternity now, and eternity future. And all of this is, is for God's glory. We're ready to close 750s when we, we can finish up this and be finished with verse. I mean, question number nine. Then he says, Well, how can we do this? How can we do this? How can we live to the praise of his glory? My brother just shared with us Second Peter uh chapter three, verses ten and following. Um uh, I'm going to give you just one word. I'm going to give you one word for you to hang on to for the praise of his glory. And it's not always the, uh, Paul says it this way, presenting all things honest in the sight of men or, pre or presenting things honest in the sight of all men. But I want to give you just one word. Write this down and keep it. If we were living in biblical days, I'd tell you to put it on your, and put it on your, uh, so you can see it all the time and have it for a remembrance. I want you to put it on your forehead. The word that we want to hold on to for the praise of his glory as, as children of God, in the family of God, as joint heirs with Christ, is integrity. That's a bigger word than what we think about. And it's much broader. It's why it's vast. If Christians could learn to be people more sincere about being a person of integrity it would speak volumes to the praise of God's glory. Huh? Absolutely. See, now, and I've said before, what we have mastered, and not everybody, maybe not even you, but we, what we have mastered in, in under the Christendom or churchism, we've mastered modified behavior. But God, God didn't call us to modify behavior. He called us to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Uh, Titus. Two and three talks about how we're living and how our conversation and conduct because of the power of the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. The regening. Modified behavior, Christians, Christians, please hear me. Modified behavior doesn't last and it doesn't work. Integrity won't even let you be happy with yourself with acting. <laughs> Let me say that again. Integrity won't even allow you to be content or happy with yourself with modified behavior or acting.
in every facet, in every dimension, in thought. Because all your actions are thoughts. That's why Paul talks about that our weapons of warfare are not carnal, but are mighty uh, in pulling down strongholds, uh, the imaginations of all things that exalt itself against the power, the will, or the word of God. It's our, the Holy Spirit, the word is the, the power to pull down strongholds. It, when you change your mind, you will change your behavior. But when you just change your behavior and your mind is still the same, trust me, you will creep back into them behaviors. We got to go, 755. But what we want to do, how do we live or how do we embrace or show gratitude or thankfulness for God's calling of us and to the praise of his glory we've got to be people of integrity that's your word for the week that's your word as we close out the year i am going to be a person of integrity now i put on christ jesus i put on the holy spirit when i envelop myself in the lord and in his word i'm going to live and think like he had a plan for me from the beginning or before the beginning. Here's what I want you to do with this integrity. Start getting your prayer request in. Get your prayer request in. We didn't have a lot join us tonight. That's okay. We didn't have a lot join us tonight. That's okay. But I want you with your integrity. Here's something that will help you with your integrity. As much as we are to count on God, and we should. Listen to me carefully. As much as we are to count on God, we're talking about integrity. I'm calling for all saints everywhere. Every Christian, every child of God is going to hear this broadcast. You're going to view it now, view it later, or you share it with somebody. Tell somebody but our minister has called us to be people of integrity. We are not to just count on God, but we are to count God in everything we do. Don't just count on God. So we do that, but we learn how to count God in. If we count God in, it would change some of the things we count on God about because some of the things we need to count on God to get us out of and get us over and get us through, we would never be in if we counted God in from the beginning. So people of integrity, we are going to learn and practice on counting God in. Uh, we don't have any prayer requests on the uh, Facebook so uh, I see all of our comments, and I missed them all. I ain't said nothing. I ain't responded to nobody. I didn't even know they was rolling. Uh, but we want to be people of integrity, counting on God, yet counting God in. I'm going to say good night, good evening. God bless you. Uh, we want to keep all of our family in prayer. Sister Yolanda, Sister Daisy, my mother, Brother Ben here. Not just Brother Ben, but always have some prayers for his children and his family as well. The children's grandmother and mother as well, uh, but also his children and his grandson as well, grandchildren. Uh, also, we want to keep uh, brother, uh, brother Travis's co-worker. And, um, and 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 persons in prayer that's requested. Also, we want to keep um, Michelle Jackson in prayer with the loss of her loved one, as well as Michelle Brooks with her cousin. Michelle Brooks, Michelle Jackson, our dear sisters to the family, uh, keep them in prayer uh, for God's comforting hand. Uh, we thank God for uh, the recovery 
uh, process of Brother Bo Brian Bobo, who has some work done uh, this past week and uh, is recovering well. So we want to keep him in prayer. My co-worker at work, uh, good, good friend of mine, good brother of mine named uh, Deontay, we want to keep him in prayer as he lost his father-in-law this uh, past week, this week here. So we want to keep him and his wife, Sharona, Sharona uh, in prayers as well. I might even say her name properly, but I can just call her Sister Miles, uh, his wife. Uh, uh, we want to keep her in prayer and the loss of her father and the family as well. Uh, so um, uh, Sister Kim is, Sister Kim, oh, go ahead. Sister Kim is asking us to keep her eight-year-old grandson in prayer. Uh, he tested positive for COVID-19. Uh, happy blessed birthday to Michelle Brooks. I didn't know it was Michelle Brooks' birthday. Happy birthday, Sister Michelle. Uh, we got a birthday here. Uh, uh, so Sister Kim White wants us to keep her eight-year-old grandson in prayer that's tested positive for COVID. What you got, uh, LaCroix? We got to get out of here. What you got? Brothers, one o'clock, brothers, one o'clock. I don't know if there's any brothers online, but one o'clock, one o'clock Saturday, one o'clock Saturday, we will be um, having our men's meeting. Uh, it is a, it, I want to say it's mandatory, but I can't make you, but it's really, really vital that all the brothers be out, be there. Uh, we encourage you to make every plan necessary to be there at one o'clock at the building, one o'clock uh, for the men's meeting. Uh, let's go to God in the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love, mercy, kindness, and goodness. Uh, thank you for your word. Thank you for those who are gathered in the sound of my voice. Remember all the families who have been afflicted and impacted by the devastation of COVID-19. Remember our, our, our uh, 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 aunt's grandson uh, testing positive. We want that family to be kept in prayer. All those who have lost loved ones. We ask your special hand of comfort for them in their hour and their time of need. As their family, we will do our best to support, love, and encourage. Father God, we ask that you bless the Church of Christ, not just Garfield Greater Heights, but the Church of Christ at large throughout this land, throughout this world, that you may continue to shed your light abroad. Thank you for Jesus the Christ, our Lord and our Savior. It's in his name we do pray. Amen. God bless you all. And if the Lord say the same, we'll see you Sunday. Have a good evening.